So my brief, my gig was to talk about the world of cooperatives and then narrow it down to the field that is the major subject of today's discussion being data. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, I've just said the, my, my interest in this area was sparked a long time ago doing competition policy review, when we're, particularly when we're looking at uh, statutory marketing, which is a top-down approach to trying to solve a number of issues which cooperatives are bottom up. And they, they are much more, you know, statutory marketing is very much an English speaking uh, phenomenon, with the exception of the United States, who never went down that route. They went down the route of cooperatives. And you know, it's still a, a very large part of the agricultural sector. Anybody who's interested in having a look at uh, the world's powerhouse of agribusiness development, which is Brazil, over the last 40 years, I would strongly recommend the late Fabio Jadad's book, recently released just before his death, uh, beginning of last year, on uh, the, the development of the Brazilian agricultural system. And you'll get a flavour of just how important cooperatives have been in that system, where governance, overall governance systems are weak, and this bottom-up approach of farmers organising themselves to be able to develop out their value chains and their industry and their research, it's been uh, quite a phenomenal growth. So from a country which was a food recipient in the 1970s to being the world's largest net export of agribusiness product, 40 years later, running on a, on a total factor productivity growth year on year of between 2 and 3 per cent, uh, these, these organisations have played a big part in that. So <clears throat> um, what's, what's co-op? That question's been raised this morning. It's a member-owned business. It may or may not be a cooperative as we understand it under uh, the, our legal definitions. Capricorn, for instance, is a corporation's law. Capricorn is a billion dollar business which is a cooperative for the purposes of the Australian tax code, uh, organised as a corporation's law company and is membership owned and membership driven. PNM Bank, also corpse law. CBH is a non-distributing cooperative. Jopman Fisherman's Cooperative is a distributing cooperative. Sweeter Banana is a distributing cooperative. So the first one has uh, the, sorry, the, the first, so the first one, a non-distributing cooperative. Most people here would be familiar with that. Uh, it's a $2 share. Um, you know, that's what you get back on the way back. Jopman Fisherman's Cooperative uh, has a share issues which are paid out on the way out. Sweeter Banana is similar to that. Pace, um, which is a um, an incorporated association based around extension and delivery. It looks like a cooperative, it quacks like a cooperative, it functions like one, yet it's organised as an incorporated association, which probably, if it were being founded these days, probably wouldn't be permitted. Organised producers in Esperance, Albany and, G and Geraldton, distributing cooperatives. To get an idea, these sort of organisations are ubiquitous, they're all around us, but not often recognised. They're there. So these are some of the largest, these are the largest in the world. $104 billion banking and credit, but look how prominent in their agriculture is. And Rabobank number eight, like CBH, <coughs> non distributing cooperative. It's been around 100 years. These are very old organisations. Um, eight and ten Australians are members of a cooperative or a mutual enterprise of some sort. And it's a uh, Collectively, the cooperative mutual uh, sector, 8.3% of GDP, is bigger than, far bigger than agriculture, bigger than construction, mining, manufacturing. So, as I said, they're ubiquitous, they're around us. In um, Australia, ranked in size, CBH is the largest. Murray Goulburn, which has just got itself into all manners of trouble through a very true and tried path of introducing external capital into its business structure is uh, now probably soon not to be, is, was the second largest of those organisations. <coughs> Most of these again are fairly old organisations. TBH has been around for a very long time, Capricorn has been around for 40 years, a little more, and then there's a couple of new ones who have popped up such as Members Equity. In WA, our agricultural examples, again, CBH, non-distributing cooperative, General Fisherman is a distributing cooperative and a very, very dedicated integrator of its value chain. It has gone right down that market and has done very well at developing market share for itself internationally. 
Wamco, Espence Organised Producers, Harvey Irrigation, very interesting model. It's a dual structured cooperative. It solves for the um, problems that Tom raised a minute ago, how so idiosyncratic these organisations can get, as all organisations can get. It solves for its particular sets of problems by sorting out into two businesses the ownership of those assets and the trading aspect of those assets. And the ownership a aspect of those assets, which take a very, very, very long time to be reinvested in over decades, essentially what happens is that the owners of those assets, the, the irrigation users, pay the rate of depreciation on the way through. And that money is put away into a sinking fund, and that's all it can be used for. <coughs> and on the other hand, there is a day-to-day -day trading business. And if that goes belly up, so be it. Those other assets are well protected. It's very, very financially stable. Well, this is such a good idea, why not more of them? A very, very prominent um, American jurist by the name of Henry Hainsman, he's a law school professor from Yale University, argues, and I think very persuasively, that a cooperative is the general form of ownership. <coughs> His argument is that the patrons of the firm, the suppliers, capital suppliers, the input suppliers, the capital suppliers, the workers or the customers, those are the four patrons. The ownership, the natural ownership of a firm is determined by a number of factors, but one of the most important is the cost of making a collective decision. Think about it. Any organisation you've worked for, the ones that hum, the ones that just feel good to be part of, and you can feel it, you can smell it when you walk into that organisation, are the ones in which people know why they're there. It has a very clear idea. The organisation is very clear about what it is it's trying to achieve, and everybody's bought into that. I'll leave you to reflect on that. Lowest cost of collective decision making. So input supplies. An example of that, for instance, in growing dairy industries around the world, they're dominated by cooperatives. Why? Because milk is highly perishable, it's capital intensive, continuous production. If I don't get picked up, I'm nailed. And there's a strong positive correlation between the size of the operation and the membership of the cooperative. Um, so in the United States, 82% of milk is picked up by a cooperative. The very largest ones will step outside and all go and do their own thing. I checked this with the USDA when I was uh, studying over there. But they do that in areas where there's the option to go to get back into another big open cooperative later on in case they get beaten up. WA Grain. CBH is the remaining bulk handler that's cooperatively owned. Why? Because it's different. Everywhere else in the state, everywhere else in the country, there's large internal markets. Farms have got options. Here, they control the ports. Okay? So it's it. they have a very tight economic interest. Customers providing missing services. Historically, insurance companies have been provided, have been founded by cooperatives. Workers, law partnerships, great example. Why? Trying to protect a body of specialised knowledge. That tight economic uh, condition, that tight economic interest, means that the lowest form of, of making collective decision around this thing is for those people to own that firm. Accountancy is often the same. And capital providers, well that's just sort of your default, <coughs> return on, in, on investment. Yeah, it's a bit like a Toyota Corolla, you can bash it around and do a lot of things. The rest of them are much more purpose-built organisations. So when I was in the States, I had to do, a, as part of my degree, uh, one of the courses I did was in finance. And the professor there was, um, he was a noted author and academic on institutional forms and his big interest was in conglomerates. And he said conglomerates don't work. They, they, they were big in the 70s and they went out of fashion. So hold on, where I come from there's this thing called West Farmers. It's a conglomerate and it works really well. It's really, really successful. So we got talking, a bit of debate around it, and ultimately it came back to, well, why? What was the reason? West Farmers has got a very, very simple objective. It's that return on investment. These were comments by Michael Cheney from 15 years ago from a BRW um, uh, article. The objective of West Farmers, as he stated at the time, was to provide satisfactory return to shareholders, over 20% in Australia over the long run. I know from people working in the Treasury there, it's actually a lot more specific than that, and they got pretty good uh, market marching orders as to what it is they're expected to achieve. He said, this has remained our primary objective ever since, and I expect it will also be, always be so. Now this, of course, is a purely financial objective. 
It doesn't have to do what you might call any operational flavour to it as opposed to an objective like becoming Australia's principal agribusiness or chemical company or hardware retailer or whatever. In short, everybody in the business knows what it is that they're there for. Make that money. I know why the company exists, is the way he explained this, and what its purpose is. I know what part I play in its success, and I know what I have to do to make every post a winner and to strive for continuous improvement and innovation if we're going to achieve our objectives. It's very clear what it is this organisation's on about. That's that low cost of collective decision making. So here's this exception to the rule of a conglomerate which has got businesses all over the place able to operate effectively. Um, West Farm has had its, uh, had its origins as a diversified regional cooperative. One of the senior people in that organisation a number of years ago put me onto a book called uh, Walter Harper and the Farmer. It was written by John Saunders in the early 50s, who laid out the history of how this organisation was put together in its inception. What these people wanted to do was to set up a regionally based organisation and s with a cell structure. And they found very quickly they didn't have the management resources to be able to do it and they had to centralise it. And what they were worried about was the problem that there would be a lot of infighting and a lot of cross-subsidy and a lot of subsidisation that they didn't want to see in the organisation. So from day one, what they did was they set up very strict cost accounting and kept each of the divisions separate. So they built a lot of inbuilt um, discipline into the system and that became part of the operational culture, which is today still West Farmers. I ran across a uh, business in southern Illinois in, uh, in the United States. It's a very large, what they call super, co uh, super local. It does um, dairy feed inputs, agronomy, um, uh, service delivery of various kinds, including um, uh, oh, what else was it doing? It was about six businesses at the time, but the two that stood out the most of all that, that struck me as the most perpendicular with each other were dairy inputs and agronomy. So how does this thing work? Because you would think that that's going to invite all sorts of conflicts of interest. They did it by much the same way. They were another West Farmers. They had evolved that same system of very strict cost accounting, and each of the businesses had to, had to return a return on investment such that it could be reinvested back into itself. The members got their value from using the asset, that's what a cooperative is, but the business itself could generate enough capital so that it could continue to grow without being subsidised by anybody else. In other words, this organisation had tremendous discipline. So what kind of cooperative? Well, it's a highly flexible corporate form. This is a property rights structure map done by Cook and Chadad. Up in that right-hand corner, how does this thing work? So up in, so this is fairly loosely defined property rights. What we mean is the ownership structure is fairly loosely defined. And this is very tightly, tightly defined down here. And this is the bit where we start getting outside um, ownership coming into the business. This organisation, this new generation cooperative structure, probably the best example in Australia is Lenswood Apple Cooperative in South Australia, which has integrated 70% of apple production in that state and has built a number of a very detailed value chain for itself, great depth. Um, you don't get any, any uh, capital from that business when you leave. You have to sell it to somebody else, like a listed company. And that share is tied to so many metres of storage. And the more profitable the business is, the more valuable that, that share is. Very, very sharp incentives for investment. Very, very sharp incentives for vertical coordination, which is what they're trying to achieve. That's the reason for that very sharp property rights structure. And this one up here, a little looser, it's the old Chitura um, uh, milk model. Worked very effectively for a long time. Very strong growth in uh, volume. These guys, you got uh, value from your use of your assets, but also got a return on your shares. Up here, proportional investment cooperative, probably up in this area starting to see something like CBH, which is you get your value from trading with the business, from using the asset, that's your major value. Down here, this is the area oh, where outside capitals come into the cooperative. This is a death patch down here. Bonlac 20 years ago, it happened to them. It's happened now to Murray Goldman. The market stagnated, so what they went, they tried to get into another segment of the market. They got out of the commodities that they were really good in, tried to go further up into the retail space with uh, supermarkets, invested a lot of money, bought in outside capital, really expensive. Bonlac did the same. 
If you're in that area, you probably want to get down to here, go to a listing. What kind of cooperative? It's a highly flexible form, but it's got to be fit for purpose. And that means, number one, clear objective. Number two, that defines your strategy, that defines your structural choices. You start that way. What's your objective, strategy, and then your structural choices? So the big question, what's the tightly defined economic objective or need that will bind a group of growers together for the mutual benefit? So in this case, what's the, what, can potential members be segmented into subgroups? So as far as data use goes, if you rank out the potential users, who are they? How do you segment these people? And then how would you define what their economic objective would be? How tight would it be so that if you can take the people for whom there is the most value relative to the amount of cost that you're going to have to bear to do this, and remember organising people is one of the largest costs going, that's where your big transaction costs are. And the bigger the group, the bigger the transaction costs. The more backwards and forwards and having to be involved, the smaller the group, the tighter it is, the less um, organisational costs you bear. Can enough value be created with a first subgroup for a business establishment? What would it do? Who would these people be? How do you find the lowest total cost, the combination of transaction costs, having to deal with each other, governance, all the rest of it, the cost of keeping the system going, and the actual cost of physical transformation? And what are the values and costs that may exist for other subgroups and members? When you come down that overall cost curve, then that, when does it start becoming more attractive for other people to come and join? Hallmark of a good cooperative. This is generally around uh, marketing cooperatives, but I think a lot of this sits here as well. Singleness of purpose, clarity of objective, knowing what, what it is that you're doing. Control over supply, particularly if you're marketing. So if this organisation was to go into marketing as well, having very strong incentives for vertical coordination and, and investment is very important. Incentives for risk capital and vertical coordination. Creating a sense of belonging, a club good. That's really important. Because what will happen is sooner or later you run into a major roadblock and the whole system will be tested. That sense of belonging, that sense of being part of something which is bigger than myself and I'm in this with other people, because we've had a few small wins together and we've built up this, this collective sense of being together, is your shock absorber. And commitment. Responsibility and benefit are complementary, a sign of a good company as members acknowledge both. I extract benefit from this. I'll extract it as when I use the asset and I may also extract it as, a, as some sort of a additional return on my investment over and above that. But at the same time I have responsibilities here and if the system itself doesn't recognise that and enforce it implicitly or explicitly then that sense of commitment can be easily lost. And I'll finish up on this, a shared common, a a shared common purpose is a powerful motivator. Again. Organisations that you go into, whether they be a business, a not-for-profit, a school, or whatever it is, and there is that sense of shared common purpose, people there have grown an extra leg. It's really powerful stuff for humans. So a pattern of development. Sweet Banana. This, was, uh, this little cooperative has been around for 16 years now, but its inception started way before that. In the early 1990s, a large volume of bananas started to come across from <coughs> Queensland and the local industry got hammered. Um, and it happened very quickly, over two or three years. What happened was that the growers there had a two, uh, embarked upon a two-stage development. And they didn't know that they were going to do this, but this is pretty well what happened. They were 20% under market <coughs> price in 1990. The big railway sleepers coming from Queensland, big, bright yellow, these little mongrel looking things from, from uh, Carnarvon, little tiny thing, can't sell them. So what they did in the early, eight, in the early 90s, they, they, they said, well, maybe it might be an idea if we, instead of just fiercely competing with each other up and down the river, what we do is we start getting together to work out where some of our common interests might be. And the first thing they worked on was grading standards, working out how it was that they were going to present the fruit that came from Carnarvon to the market so that everybody understood what this one meant and what that one meant. That was their first big win. The second thing they started to do after that was then providing extension to members because one thing a farmer can't do is go on to a farm and tell another farmer what it is that he thinks he ought to be doing. That just doesn't work. So, the first, so what they did then was put a levy on each of their boxes, raise enough money and 
hired as an independent third party to go around and adjudicate and sort out and train people on what those grading standards should look like. Again, that built further sense of ties and we're in this and we're working together. So they were successful, they were successful enough to develop a, a lunchbox brand, which you probably have seen around the place. And that was about 1997. Well, that worked, so the next step well, after that was to try and actually pack and put into the market as a coordinated unit. That stripped a lot of costs out of the value chain. It also allowed them to be able to build a very close working relationship with one particular supermarket. That then in turn led to further investments into their supply chain and their equipment, um, pick up a lot of efficiencies. This has been a very successful business and by 2010 they were doing 20% over the market. A long process. The process of putting together a cooperative like this will not be short. It will be long because it needs to be iterative and people have to be taken along for, a, for the journey. This is a bottom-up approach. Thanks.